Hello, welcome everyone to GraphQL Berlin. This is meetup number 22. Uh, this is the 22nd edition of the GraphQL Berlin meetup. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm a developer advocate here at Prisma, and I'm very happy to be hosting today to bring you lots of great content. Uh, so this is GraphQL Berlin, of course, but uh, even though it started in Berlin, now that we are uh, virtual, we are broadcasting to everywhere. So uh, we're based here in Berlin at Prisma, but it is uh, going out to everyone around the world. Um, so we've got four really awesome speakers today, and there's going to be some prizes involved as well. So stay tuned throughout the meetup for uh, for all of that. Um, we have today Mateus Cordoso. He's going to be uh, giving a presentation, The Case for Lighter GraphQL Client Libraries. We've then got Phil Pluckman. He is going to be talking about Urkel. And we then have Adi Pratap Singh and Mariano Cabriel. And uh, they'll tell, they'll give a joint uh, presentation talking about scaling GraphQL at Zalando. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're running a quiz today. So stay tuned for a quiz, the quiz going on throughout the meetup. And there's going to be some prizes involved. So Let's talk about the quiz, how we're going to deal with that. The quiz is going to be run through Slido. So we've got Slido set up. And the, what you can do here is you can scan this QR code, or you can go to this link, slido.com slash GraphQL. And if you do that, in fact, I'm actually going to just pull up my phone right now to uh, to get myself oriented with Slido for the, uh, for the meetup. If you go to that link, you're going to get basically a UI that's going to give you um, a way to, to enter yourself into the, uh, the quiz. You're going to be able to answer questions and be able to participate. So make sure you head over there. I'll just leave this up for a minute so that folks can get set up with Slido. Um, as I mentioned, the quiz is going to run throughout the course of the events. We'll have uh, various questions coming up uh, as we go. And your participation will be awesome if you can, can jump into those questions. Um, and then I've got a note here that the quicker you answer questions, the higher your chances of winning. So there's a time-based um, aspect of this as well. So with that said, let's see here. We have got some prizes for you today. You can win a Bedrock license. If you haven't heard of Bedrock, Bedrock is this uh, this framework, if you will, or maybe this, uh, this boilerplate, I guess is a better word, by uh, Max Stoiber. And it puts together all sorts of awesome resources, things like Next.js, uh, GraphQL, uh, built in with uh, authentication ready to go, uh, subscription payments, Teams, all of these things that go into what you need to get started building a SaaS app. So the idea is Max has spent tons of time <laughs> putting all these things together kind of handpicking various uh, aspects to to put into this this boilerplate that will save you a ton of time and we have got a license as a prize today um, so uh, Max Stoiber cannot be here with us today. He's celebrating his 18th birthday, but he does say hello to all of our attendees, and we're excited to give away one of his licenses. Uh, other prizes to talk about, we have got some Prisma swag. So for the runners up, we are going to have a Prisma swag pack. It's a t-shirt and stickers, and that will uh, be going out to the runner up of the, the quiz today. Um, so with that said, let's get ourselves kind of started with the quiz. Um, if everyone can open up Slido, uh, hopefully you've got that loaded in your mobile app. Uh, show us where you're coming from. We already put in a couple of spots. I'm coming to you from Ottawa today. Uh, that's where I live. We got some folks from Berlin, and it looks like we're starting to see where other people are coming from. Lots from Berlin, that's to be expected. But we've got other places uh, from all over the world. Antarctica, that's awesome. Whoever is joining us from Antarctica, hope you're keeping warm and uh, welcome everyone else who is coming to us from around the world. So we'll leave this up for just a second to see what kind of reach we have have with the 22nd edition of GraphQL Berlin today. Once again, even though it's based in Berlin, it's going out to everybody. So another couple seconds of this. It looks like we're getting some awesome representation from all over the world. So that is just great. 
Cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on now. I think uh, people have gotten a chance to get familiar with Slido. Give us to give us your sense. Uh, give us a sense of where you're coming from. And the next thing we'll take a look at, we'll be jumping right into the first talk. Uh, so first speaker today, Mateus Cardoso. Mateus is an iOS engineer and open source enthusiast based in Brazil, and he loves sharing knowledge and elegant solutions through code. His presentation today is called "The Case for Lighter GraphQL." client libraries. And without any further delay, I am going to bring in Mateus and uh, say hello to you. Mateus, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, Ryan. Really glad to be here. Um, hi, everyone. I can't see you, but so that's kind of a bit weird for me. But uh, I hope you will enjoy this talk. Um, I, I had a really, really big blast working with everyone from the event organization. Um, and it's been a crazy day for me. So Sorry if I made some mistake here. My tabs are going crazy, and um, yeah, I hope you're. I hope you're also listening to me because my mic is a bit complicated, and I was setting up before the event. Um, you are you're yeah. coming through just fine. So yeah, we're That's we're fine. excited for this talk. This is one that I'm looking forward to as well because I think there definitely should be a case uh, to be made for lighter GraphQL client libraries. So I'm very excited. Uh, why don't you pop in your screen if you could? You can share screen there, and I will I will put it up. And we will uh, be off the way. Lots going on <laughs> with me right now, <laughs> but hopefully I'll get the right stuff up in a minute. Cool. All right. Looks like we're good to go. Okay. <clears throat> so do I show up when the slides are? Um, I'm seeing like, uh, StreamYard here, that that infinite mirror mirror effect that we get yeah. in StreamYard. But uh, okay. head over um, to your slides. So when I go to my slides, where is that? Um, yeah, so as I said, kind of crazy day, but <laughs> no worries. Okay, let's go to this. Let me set up some stuff. I think I need to have a better. So All I'll right. do some setting up first. Oh, sorry, guys. No problemo. <clears throat> set up my second monitor here in a second. Okay. Do it. For those just joining us, if you're popping in now, uh, just a reminder, we do have lots of great stuff going on today. So you'll want to stick around throughout. We've got quizzes happening uh, after each talk, and there are prizes to be won. Um, mentioned just previous to this, we've got a Bedrock license. So Bedrock, the, uh, the boilerplate put together by Max Stoiber. We've got a license for, uh, for that going out. And we've also got some great Prisma swag uh, going out as well. So stay tuned for that. Oh. And Mateos, how are we doing there? Yeah, I'm just setting up my second monitor. Just a second. Of course, it wouldn't work with it disconnected. Now it's connected. OK, seems like we're set. Awesome. I will let you take it away, Mateus. Of course. So just a few more considerations. Uh, yeah, just glad to be here and to be speaking among other really awesome subjects. I hope mine is also great for you to hear about. And let's get started. So just a little bit about me. I'm Matos Cardozo. I'm a developer advocate and iOS engineer. Um, I'm based in Brazil. And uh, today I'm working as a developer advocate at Stream. We are a company that builds feeds and chat SDKs. Uh, and we have a strong developer relations team that's always building awesome open source stuff. And today I'm kind of presenting one of our projects. Uh, so yeah, working on a lot of on open source, uh, writing a lot and doing lots of community stuff. Uh, and yeah, of course, I build a lot of stuff using the Swift language. Uh, it's the main language for iOS development. And you can also use it to write on Linux. Uh, you can use it on AWS Lambda as well as of like really recently, it got uh, some support for that. And I'll speak more about it later. And yeah, um, I have a puppy named Boss. It's a 
uh, the joy of my life right now. And yeah, he doesn't like food. Uh, he likes to eat stuff that's not food. So I need to, you know, keep removing stuff from his mouth all the time. And yeah, do some surfing as well for the fun and the exercise. And yeah, I think that's a lot about me already. Um, today, I'm here to talk about my case for lighter GraphQL find libraries, uh, which I think are missing, at least for some uh, important languages. And yeah, also about the quiz, uh, I'm going to be really nice and provide some hints. So if you see something that's orange, perhaps that will help you answer the quiz. Um, so yeah, let's start how I got here and why I'm talking about the subject. Um, me and my team were building this app called Combase, which you can see in the image. Um, so what is it? It's a customer support chat um, platform similar to Intercom, but more flexible. So you will have agents uh, chatting with customers. Just a second, I'm having some issues here. Okay, just a minor second. I messed things up. Okay. So yeah, it has a live chat widget, which you can integrate in a website or in native mobile apps. Uh, and it's open source. You can check it out on GitHub. I'll give more details later. And it also has a GraphQL API, of course, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, but like this platform you're looking at, I didn't build it. Um, other members of my team were responsible for the front end and the back end portions, uh, including the GraphQL API itself. So what did I do then? If I didn't build that platform and I didn't build the GraphQL API, what, what did I do? Uh, I, as I said earlier, my background is as an iOS engineer. So naturally, I was in charge of building the iOS SDK for it so that you can integrate your customer support chat inside native iOS apps for your users. And that may really involve interfacing with the GraphQL API my other teammates built. Um, but I also had this SDK, uh, I had to keep this SDK as lightweight as possible. So increasing the size of the apps using the SDK wouldn't be much of an issue. And these requirements ultimately forced me to create our own GraphQL library for iOS, which I called Tiny GraphQL, and which is also open source. So it was really surprising to me that when I started building the SDK, with, like there weren't any libraries out there that were light, you know, that, that were simple for me to use as well. So, but yeah, I know, I know that. You know, like we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. That there are other libraries out there, but I had, I just had unmet requirements. You know, uh, none of the wheels I found out there fit my requirements. They were either too heavy, uh, they were unreliable, or had too many known issues. Some of them were using outdated syntax and tooling. Uh, others were like outright unmaintained and others just too much for my tiny use case of caching, real-time code generation, um, all that sort of stuff I didn't need and would only add size and complexity to the SDK I was building. So apart from the unmet requirements, I was just excited to have some fun coding with this. And I'm sure some people out there feel the same, you know? So one of the motivations was also to help out the community, you know, other people that needed this kind of lighter weight library I was building. Um, and of course, just, I love learning new stuff. So, you know, building a library for GraphQL, which is a, an API, a kind of API I've, I, I've used before, but not a lot. So uh, building something for it uh, helped me understand a lot about it. Um, so before we, we dive into what this new wheel looks like, uh, let's look at the current state of the art library, which is of course, Apollo iOS. And I'll give a few reasons why I can use it and then go over them in detail. Um, first thing I realized is that it takes too many steps, um, to get from an empty project to making the first query. The second thing is that 
once you install it, it pulls too many sub dependencies, like bloating your project right away. And then of course it helps lead to a large binary size so that you cannot, so that maybe you're not able to afford if you have a size restricted target. So uh, Apple recently released, um, about the large binary size, Apple recently released a feature on iOS 14 called App Clips, and it's restricted to 10 megabytes. So you can't have a binary size of over 10 megabytes or else uh, you, you, your app will get rejected. So that's also one of the reasons I built this library. And yeah, also requires extra tooling and code generation to work, adding more complexity to your workflow. So you'll need to add some scripts to your, um, you'll, add, you'll, you'll add some scripts to your CI to generate the schema and all that sort of stuff will increase your build time and other stuff. So what does it look like to get from an empty project to your first query using Apollo iOS? The first step is to install the library itself using any of the available dependency managers. So this will affect your project by adding seven dependencies and hopefully they're not incompatible with dependencies you're already using because that can happen as well. Like maybe, maybe the Apollo iOS uh, library will use some dependency that you're already using and then that will clash and you won't be able to build your project unless you synchronize your, your dependencies. Uh, it will also add 7.2 megabytes to your app size, which may be a problem if you're targeting, as I said, the Apple's new app clips, which are restricted to 10 megabytes and that's already 7.2. So that's more, that, that takes 72% of the uh, size restriction already. So it's terrible for SDKs that want to be lightweight. And we'll also add an annoying 17 seconds to your build time. So every time you want to build your project, uh, from start, it takes 17 seconds more just for the Apollo iOS dependencies. And then you need to download your GraphQL schema, which can be part of the build sequence and adding even more time than those 17 seconds. Uh, and then you generate code from that schema, which can also be part of the build process, adding even more time. And then you create query files that the code generator, that the code generator turns into Swift classes which you can then finally use that to run the Apollo client, to, to run the queries using the Apollo client. So some of these things might be totally worth it for very large projects with hundreds of models and queries and complex views, but that's not the case and it wasn't the case for my project. So for my project, I didn't need or want 90% of this stuff. It was just like really getting in the way and, and, and making things slow for me. So using Apollo iOS was discarded like very early on. So what should I do then? You know, make raw requests through HTTP because that's possible, right? Um, you can run it and, and, and make an HTTP call with the GraphQL query encoded inside the body or inside the query uh, string. But that's great. It looks terrible. Uh, uh, it looks unreliable. But let's see why we shouldn't do that. First, like you have to write the GraphQL code as a string, which can lead to, sort of, uh, to all sorts of mistakes. And that can be caught during build time. Second, you need to be aware of some uh, conventions. So like mutations need to be post requests with the GraphQL code in the body. While queries need to be a get request with the GraphQL in the query stream. So, and finally, you also need to make sure you're using the correct encoding for the body and the query stream. And that the correct the, the correct headers as well. So yeah. While that keeps things really lightweight and not as complex as using Apollo, um, it makes our life harder with the lack of syntax check and build time, which is going to have you make mistakes pretty often. Um, and all the boilerplate code to make the GraphQL requests via HTTP, which beyond making a couple queries would become like really tedious uh, really quickly. So, 
um, yeah, and you get like really tired of making mistakes. So that's when I figured out I had no choice but to build my own library and my goals were pretty clear. Uh, I wanted to keep the build time syntax check that Apollo had. Uh, I wanted to, to avoid like any HTTP boilerplate. So, you know, the, the user of the library doesn't need to know about, about HTTP. Uh, and I needed a very lightweight library. So with the least impact and binary size. So let's start uh, building our library. Uh, it doesn't mean it's better than other existing libraries, but it will fit better with some uh, mostly non-complex use cases. Uh, first, I tried building a domain-specific language inside Swift that matched the GraphQL code as closely as possible. So it would feel kind of familiar if you already knew GraphQL. Uh, I also included an HTTP request builder logic, which takes care of all the HTTP boring stuff. And the code is pretty small and has no sub-dependencies to build your project. So in fact, it only adds 100 kilobytes uh, to your binary. So 70 times smaller than the Apollo library and practically no concern if you're uh, doing it in app clips. So what is tiny GraphQL? It is essentially a library that lets you use pure Swift syntax to create valid uh, GraphQL requests. First of all, it had to be really simple to use. Um, it had to have no sub-dependencies, and it had to be open source. And you're able to check it out on GitHub, participate, and it has an incredibly low binary impact, as I said earlier. So let's compare the GraphQL syntax with the code that generates it. I'll use like examples straight from GitHub's GraphQL API, because it's kind of like you know, the hello world of GraphQL APIs, in my opinion. And as you can see, I turned the query keyword into a class named query on Swift. Uh, and there's also a similar class for mutation. The operation name goes in the first position of the initializer. The arguments of the operation become a dictionary in the second position of the initializer. And the list of fields are constructed using a function builder, which is just a fancy way in Swift of turning this sequence of fields, uh, instantiation statements into an array. Uh, so this is just synthetic sugar to not require commas and array brackets. Uh, it's also possible to simplify even further by just using strings directly for the fields. Uh, this is because there's a, an implicit conversion built in that will turn those strings into field objects. So it gets pretty similar to the uh, original GraphQL code. Now um, let's take a look into a more complex key, uh, query with fields inside fields. So as you can see, it's possible to nest fields inside fields as much as you wish, but you'll need to include the field keyword if the field has children's or arguments. So it's just uh, a limitation for now uh, for the Swift language that I couldn't simplify that. Um, and next, mutations. Um, they are not much different from queries except for the mutation class name. There's no nesting limit or anything like that. So you can nest arguments inside arguments uh, all you want for operations and fields as well. Um, Okay, now that we've seen how the syntax kind of works, let's see how you use it uh, in practice. So of course, there is uh, an instance that you need to create uh, the GraphQL, the tiny GraphQL um, class. It holds all the uh, common logic that you'll most likely want for all your operations. So for instance, the GraphQL endpoint, uh, the headers for things like authorization and such, Actually, this class was renamed uh, a few uh, kind of a week ago to just GraphQL, but I didn't have time to change the slides. Um, and again, we define the operation we want um, with that syntax we just uh, went over. Next, we create a URL session request using the tiny GraphQL object. And finally, we use that request with the native URL session API. 
and you get your response. So it's as simple as that. So all this request stuff is pretty much native uh, Swift uh, from the native um, foundation library. And that's it. That's all you need to make a request with tiny GraphQL. It's, it's incredible. I, I think that um, we didn't have like a popular library that does this because you know it's just too limiting. Uh, because we get like from five steps, seven dependencies, 7.2 megabytes in binary size and 17 seconds in build time to just two steps, one dependency, 100 kilobytes in pack and 0.5 seconds in, in build time. So does this mean that tiny GraphQL is better than Apollo? Well, let's say that we're kind of speaking about apples and oranges. Um, you'd still probably better off with Apollo for complex apps. And if the increase in binary size is not a, an issue, and I'm certain you'd be better served by tiny GraphQL if you're building a simple app or an SDK, um, or if a binary size is a concern at all, you wouldn't want your SDK impact um, size too much, for example. So before we get to future plans and current blockers for the library, I just wanted to dive into uh, the implementation a little bit. I know it's not a Swift event, but I really like the language and I hope you'll enjoy how I achieve the syntax. So I'll go over the modeling of the library, the protocols, the structures, uh, the syntax tricks I employed to make the DSL close to that of GraphQL, and also how I'm parsing those uh, models into HTTP requests. So let's start with this example. Uh, right at the beginning, you instantiate a query object, which could also be a mutation. It's pretty much the same. Uh, and here is the implementation of query. I'll just go over the interesting bits. So it's a structure that conforms to the query operation protocol. Protocol are kind of uh, interfaces in other languages. And we do that here just to reuse the parsing logic and uh, if you want to create your own type safe queries, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later, you can conform to that protocol and execute your custom query without any additional setup. And that protocol requires you to specify a type for the arguments. In this case, the query takes a dictionary of string to argument representable, and that's propagated down to the argument property and initializer. And argument representable is another protocol in tiny, GraphQL, uh, in, in tiny GraphQL, which any type that can be in the value of an argument needs to conform to. The library provides the implementation for string and dictionary. So you can nest dictionaries as values inside dictionaries to emulate custom object types in your GraphQL schema. So going back to the query structure, the next interesting bit is a function builder that takes field representable objects. So a function builder in Swift is essentially a syntactic sugar for declaring arrays. I'll show that. I'll show just what I mean. So it essentially lets us get rid of brackets and commas um, and get the syntax closer to that of GraphQL with the curly braces and no commas. Apart from that, uh, so apart from that, just a second. Um, so apart from that, we can also, I just do that a little bit lots here, but yeah, that's, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say about that, uh, how I achieved the syntax. And I wanted to say a little bit about the next steps in this library's evolution. Um, so first, we need uh, optional extensions at some point, like caching, uh, real-time stuff that's possible with Apollo. Uh, and of course, we need the full GraphQL spec uh, uh, represented in the library, which is not done yet. And I need to improve the DSL as well. And also improve the type safety so you can have it more and more type safe. 
Um, and actually, there is some initial work done for type safety. Uh, so you can create your own query types by conforming to the query operation protocol. Uh, and you can specify the types of the arguments by creating a nested argument structure. So then the compiler will require that the arguments be correctly filled in. You know, just like here below, you need you actually need to have a login, you know, instead of like it being a dictionary and then you figuring out some mistake in, uh, during running your app. And then you can use your query in a more type safe way, of course. So, but this is still like early work. I'm still trying to simplify this in some ways that are not yet possible with Swift. And on that note, I wanted to talk about some blockers I reached with Swift and which features I'd like to see added to the language so I can improve the tiny GraphQL library. So first, I need more codable conformances. Codable is Swift's ability to serialize and deserialize strong types such as structures, enums, and classes. Uh, but for now, tuples don't conform to codable, and that would be perfect to improve the syntax around type-safe arguments. Also, enums with associated values aren't codable, and uh, that would be perfect for the type-safe fields. So, and finally, type inference is uh, uh, type inference in function builder closure. So this would allow us to omit the class names inside the fields list, which would bring that syntax like really close to that of GraphQL. Um, so if these features and maybe some more are implemented in Swift, this library will be like at its best in the future. So as you can see, like on the left, it's how it is right now. And on the right, it's how I'm envisioning it once like all the features are implemented in Swift. Um, and like that's pretty much it for the meat of the talk. Like I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm just gonna give some extra information about the Swift language, and uh, that could be useful in the future for you. So as I said in uh, at first, the main language for iOS development is Swift, uh, but it's also getting very popular for server side development. Uh, it very recently gained an AWS Lambda runtime. And of course, it's open source. It's originally built by Apple, but it's evolving like very rapidly with the help of the community. And yeah, uh, again, uh, it has an open evolution process that's not dictated by Apple. The community can propose changes and all that. And Many features were implemented by the community and not by Apple. Um, OK, so just sometimes for the links, all right, I'd like you to please visit the tiny GraphQL repository. Um, it has lots of cool details. And you can check, check it out how it works more closely there. Um, I'll give you actually a few seconds to take note of that link. Really, really, really go visit it. So github.com slash getstream slash tiny GraphQL. And I'll wait here five seconds. <laughs> um, and also, we have another open source project called Swift Lambda. So it's a launch pad for your AWS Lambdas written in Swift. And it has some samples like chatbots, content moderation, and more written in Swift and deployable with one command. I'll give, a, I'll give you also <laughs> a few seconds to take note of that link. So github.com slash getstream slash swift dash lambda. Um, and yeah, also some extra links here. If you're interested in learning even more, uh, please visit my blog at dev.2 slash Cardoso. I have blog posts about some of these projects there and more. Um, also give you a few seconds to take note of that link, dev.2 slash Cardoso, and also my Twitter account that you can, you know, I announce everything there and I talk about um, some subjects about Swift that, you know, are not worthy of like a full blog post. Um, so yeah, please follow me there.
And that's pretty much it actually for the whole talk. Um, maybe that went fast, I don't know. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed it and that you've learned something today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matus. That was uh, an awesome talk. So uh, thank you very much um, for giving that talk. If there are any questions, please feel free uh, to put them into the chat. We're going to take a, a quick time for Q&A. Um, and we are going to see if there are any questions that come up here. So we got some thank yous. Thank you for the awesome talk. And then we've got one here uh, from Hendrik. So Hendrik says, I like to talk very much. Had a similar problem in JS right now. We're in building SDK. But even the tiny GraphQL package request is quite big for making HTTP requests. So some people that are feeling the pain that you have uh, dealt with too. So that's great. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in. We're going to move very quickly here to uh, to a um, set of uh, quiz questions for Matus's talk. And we are going to take a look at that maybe right now if there is nothing coming in for Q&A. So I'm going to add in my slide here and then i'm just going to pop over to the first of the quiz questions so this will kick it off we've got four questions here um and people can join the quiz names are going up as we speak um so once again if you have if you're just popping in and you haven't gotten set up yet go to slido.com s-l-i-d-o.com slash graphql that will get you into position here to take the quiz uh, once you're there, you're going to see on your phone, you're going to see um, something that says join. You can join. So I'm going to join right now. And my name should have popped right in. There it is. I see myself. And we are going to uh, just give a sec for users to, to join in here um, so that we can all participate in the quiz. More are coming in. And uh, once again, we've got we've got four questions here, um, or maybe it's three. I can't because uh, the slides that I'm seeing on my other screen are kind of blank. They're like generic Slido um, uh, slides, and so there might just be three. I can't quite remember. In any case, we're going to start the quiz very shortly. We'll give another minute or two though for people to to join in. Um, and uh, maybe as we do wait, Matus, uh, give give a plug one more time, and and I can pop it into uh, into the the chat here for people to take a look at your libraries. If you just want to, uh, maybe even uh, post it in the the private chat that we've got here in um, in Streamyard. I can then copy it over to the the comments in the channel if you want to do that. Yep, yeah, doing that right now. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, grab those two that you were mentioning at the end. We can direct people straight towards them to those projects on GitHub. And uh, so there is one. We've got tiny GraphQL. I'm going to copy this over. So we'll do copy and then over to the comments. So check it out here. This is tiny GraphQL. There is the GitHub link. And then we've got one more, which is Swift Lambda. I'll copy that and put it into the comments as well. So there we go. Check out those links um, if you are interested in stuff around Tiny GraphQL or Swift Lambda. Uh, it looks like we're kind of settling here at the number of people who are joining in for our quiz. So I think we will kick it off. And here we go for question number one. Which Swift feature was used to emulate the list of fields in Tiny GraphQL? Got a number of options here. Dynamic member lookup, function builders, generics, variadic functions, or closures. Those are your options for this one. If you are confident about an answer, try to get it in as fast as you can. The uh, Your response time does, uh, does play a part in where you're going to land for your results here. So feel free to uh, put in your answers. We're going to wait. I think I saw 27 on the board. So we'll we'll just uh, wait quickly for, for everyone to get their answers in before moving on to the next one, at least until we settle uh, in the number of responses. In the meantime, I'm going to put another link that Matus provided. This is to your Twitter. So check out Matus on Twitter and uh, give him a follow there. 20 answers in. We'll just wait another minute or two before moving on to the next one. I think it's starting to settle, though. So in about five, four, three, two, one, here we go to question number two. 
Actually, first we get a look at uh, at the answers or the the responses. 45% said function builders, and the next two runners up are dynamic member lookup and variadic functions. I think function builders might be where we're at. Let's take a look. That is, in fact, the correct answer. So for those of you who answered function builders, great work. All right, uh, here's the leaderboard. Thomas at number one with one question out of one, and we've got a number of followers there. Let's check out this other one. Which API was used to demonstrate the tiny GraphQL syntax? We've got the GitLab API, the Spotify API, Dropbox, uh, GitHub, or Google Maps. Um, so number of options there. Which API was used to demonstrate the tiny GraphQL syntax? This one, if you were paying attention, should be fairly straightforward. <clears throat> Have you tried uh, playing with all of these APIs, Matthias? I wonder. Have you have you tried out each of these? Yeah, not not actually all of them. I just added the right answer and kind of made up the other ones. <laughs> so they do they do all in fact have an API. We know that much. Yeah, for sure. I just don't know if it's GraphQL. <laughs> <laughs> Spotify's API is pretty cool. I, I like that one. You can like um, essentially press play on a song from you know an API call, which is interesting. Yeah, that's nice. <clears throat> All right, we've got 19 answers. We've got 20. I think that's probably going to be it. So we are going to move right along in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oh, 21. I'll give you another three seconds. Three, two, one. Here we go. Responses have come in. GitHub API is the clear winner here, 81%. And if we take a look at the correct answer, it is, in fact, the GitHub API. So GitHub API, one of uh, probably the best known um, GraphQL APIs out there. And I think other, other ones like Shopify, you didn't have Shopify on the list, but Shopify has a GraphQL API as well. Some uh, very awesome uh, API providers out there in the wild. All right, so Sergio goes to the top, answered in 17 seconds. So great job there. And we now have another quiz question. What's Tiny GraphQL's main feature? Uh, is it very lightweight? Uh, it's got code generation, it's real time, type safety, uh, or full GraphQL spec support. So the, the main feature that Matthias went over today, what is it for Tiny GraphQL? We'll let uh, the answer settle up to around 20, 21 or so, and then we'll be on our way. We're almost there. All right, we've got 20. Let's give five seconds left. Five, four, three, two, one. On we go. It's very lightweight. This was, I think, the exact right answer. This is what I picked up from the talk. And indeed, that is the correct answer. So Sergio's at the top of the leaderboard. Uh, there we go. We've got um, uh, another question here. This is the last question. What are the two reasons to avoid Apollo libraries? Uh, is it un is it because they're unreliable and lack support? They don't have enough features and are outdated, bad and built by evil people. I don't think that's the one. Uh, it has a bad community and is an open source. I don't think that's right either. And it, the last option here can be too complex or heavy for some use cases. So um, you touched on this in your talk. You went over as well some reasons that people might want to choose to, to use Apollo if they have complex situations in their application that might need doing um, with Apollo and if they don't mind the, the binary size. But I believe that your solution is much more lightweight. Let's see if we can get up to 20 in five, four, three, two, one. There we go. Responses have come in. 89% say option E it can be too complex or lightweight. Uh, sorry, it can be too complex and heavy for some use cases, rather. That is the correct answer. Leaderboard stands at uh, with Thomas at the top. So there we go. Awesome job, everyone. Thank you for participating in the quiz. Matus, thank you very much for being here today and sharing your libraries and your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully, we'll share with you again very soon. So take care. Of course, I was. I'm really glad to have you in this talk, and thanks for all your support. Awesome, thanks. See you later.
All right, so we are moving right along uh, at this GraphQL Berlin meetup number 22. If you're just joining us, my name's Ryan. I'm a developer advocate at Prisma, and we are happy to be putting on the uh, 22nd installment of GraphQL Berlin. We're going to move into our second talk. Um, just a quick announcement before we do, though. Um, if you are here recruiting at all, if you are looking for people to join your company or join a company that you're rec recruiting for, uh, we'd appreciate if maybe you could just put those, um, make make that known in the comments of the video rather than kind of pinging in the the uh, the, the sidebar. So you can you can, down below in the comments of the video, you can put in any kind of messages about recruiting. But in the live chat, let's keep uh, keep the live chat to kind of inclusive community discussion discussion about the uh, the video uh, the uh, the talks at hand, etc. Um, we'd appreciate that very much. We are going to move on to our next speaker, and I am going to. To add him in right now. This is Phil. Welcome, Phil, to uh, to GraphQL Berlin. So, Phil Pluckthun, he's going to give us an introduction to Urkel. Phil has got extensive experience as a developer working with data, replatforming, and state management. He's a strong proponent of React, pushing for its use in web apps, and even co-founding the Reactive London Meetup. He's also a core contributor for Styled Components, the most downloaded CSS in JS library in 2017. Since joining Formidable, Phil has focused on building React Native developer tools and creating consumer-facing React Native apps for clients. So welcome, Phil. Glad to have you here. Good to be, to be here. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Awesome. So I, uh, without further ado, am going to pass it right over to you. Are you all set with your slides? It looks like you are. We'll add them to the stream here. And uh, okay. yes, take it away, Phil. Mm -hmm. Look, look right, it's broken. Oh, well, oh, well. That, that, that is not good. good. Hey, Ryan, did I go to brain teeth? <laughs> Is it, uh, it looks like it might be a little bit um, choppy there from our end. Is it looking like that for you as well? No, no. I'm the screen. Okay, so. Um, that's, that's very odd. Let me just, let me just try that again. All right, so we'll we'll pass it in here. That is, that is not there, is it? Yeah, I think that I think it might be coming through now. What I'm going to try, Phil, because your your audio is getting a bit choppy there. So what I might do is just try uh, let's try killing your video for a second. I want to see if that's going to uh, if that's going to help us out in, in in terms of the bandwidth here. So you want to just shut off your video real quick there. Let's try, let's try that. All right. How about now? Give me a give me a, a mic check. It's still it's still a bit choppy. I'm wondering if it might be uh, if it might be the headphones, the Air AirPods that are are causing issues. What do you think? Any any chance we can try with uh, with another mic? It's very very awesome. Yes, yesterday it worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How's this? Is this better? Much, much better. Very good. So let's uh, flip your video back on, and we'll see if we can get the full experience here. This is not quite optimal, the screen sharing. Oh, God. Right. Sorry, I'm just going to, going to figure out the slide situation. That is, I haven't no seen problem. that before. Your your audio sounds much better. I think we're good to put your your video back in if you like. Um, for those joining us, if you are just joining us, um, this is GraphQL Berlin number twenty two. We've got prizes today. If you haven't uh, heard already, we've got a license for Bedrock that we'll be giving away. Bedrock is a boilerplate put together by Max Stoiber that makes it very easy to get going with a SaaS application. It gives you all of the uh, the stuff you need to get moving quickly. So we're giving away a license to that. And we've also got some Prisma swag that's going out. So that'll be the runner up prize. And uh, participation in the quiz that we've got running all throughout the meetup is what will get you a prize. So stick around for that. And uh, let's see, Phil, I can see your, uh, your, your, share, your, your screen seems to be sharing down below. Do you want me to add it in here? Yeah, I mean, it looks a bit broken, but let's see how that goes. 
<clears throat> let's see if we can make this work. I think we should be good. And uh, yeah, feel free to flip your video back on if you like to. I'm going to pop out, and I'll let you take it away. All right, let's try this again. Sorry about that. I'm just a bit confused by all oh, the screen sharing. Oh, well. So um, I'm going to move right along. I'm going to pause a bit longer on each slide in case the stream is not quite picking it up as quickly as I'd like to. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to talk a bit about GraphQL client architecture today, specifically about a library we're developing at Formidable, which is called Urkel. A bit about me first. I'm a developer advocate at Formidable. You can find me on Twitter at underscore PhilPL. And if you know Formidable, you might have seen us before because of our open source libraries. Uh, we have quite the selection of libraries actually amongst not only Urkel, we also have Spectacle, Renature, and Victory, and a lot more that I can't fit onto a single slide. We're a consultancy, so if you need help solving any kind of problems with React Native development, React development, or beyond with design or project management, then let us know, and we'll see how we can help. So, but I'm eventually actually just here to talk about Urkel today. And Urkel is a GraphQL client for the web. And specifically, we built it initially out of frustration with GraphQL at the time we started it. Uh, and we released V1, I think, at the beginning of 2019, so quite a while ago now. Uh, the goal was to build a new competing GraphQL client with a rather you know, alternative to the back then stagnant and monopolistic kind of environment for GraphQL. Uh, even if you're using GraphQL today in your web apps, you might be using Apollo or Relay. We wanted to provide kind of a different client to that with a different feature set, kind of different uh, advantages and drawbacks. So while I could talk more about uh, kind of how its API works, how you can get started with it, uh, ultimately, there are a lot of different ways in which you can use Urkel. And more importantly today, I wanted to focus on the guiding principles that we used to kind of um, get started with Urkel, drive its development. And I've worked on a lot of larger open source projects, also smaller ones, and a lot of them never go beyond making a plan. Never go beyond making a plan apart from uh, making X thing work. Uh, and it's really important, in my opinion, to define some guiding principles like these to later on make good decisions in terms of API design, in terms of what your goals are, what paths to take. And ultimately, uh, I'm not going to talk about everything ERC related today, but hopefully I'm going to give you a good overview of how we built it. And of course, maybe that convinced you to check it out. Uh, maybe it tells you more about how Urkel is a bit different than maybe Apollo and Relay and see which, which kind of niche we're filling. And maybe it will also give you some ideas on how you can structure your open source projects and how you can kind of build this long-term vision. API design is hard, after all, to get right. Um, and if you go to the Urkel site or to our repository, you might see a first description pop up. And this description may not be what you're seeing right now on the slides, but for today's purposes, I would kind of describe Urkel and our guiding principles as being novel, versatile, and intuitive. Um, so if you're thinking about GraphQL clients like it, you might see people on Twitter describing Urkel differently. You might hear small and fast, maybe even blazing fast, as the buzzwords go. Uh, it's really overused terms. So instead, I'm going to kind of explain what I mean with these terms and with these guiding principles specifically. So if we're putting this into more words, um, we've kind of developed Urkel after these three principles. Uh, with novel, I meant we developed it from first principles. So we don't follow any kind of API design trends. We try to take inspiration, but not without second thought. We discuss things before adding them. Uh, versatile means we keep Urkel unopinionated and flexible. So we would still like to have a small core library and then allow you to extend and customize it. Every API, every GraphQL schema is a bit different. You may have different needs. 
and a whole different app they're using differently. So it's important to have a GraphQL cloud that can really adapt to what you need. Uh, lastly, intuitive when extended. Um, as we kind of extend Oracle and as we get later into its plugin system, which we call exchanges, um, all additions that we make to a library like this, to an ecosystem, introduces a lot of complexity, a lot of new things to learn. And that needs to be managed. So one idea we had in the beginning was, well, whatever features we provide that can be added on, all of these need to be very intuitive and they can't compromise on ease of use. So just uh, that was the short overview of things. But to kind of break this down a bit further, the first point was, develop them first principles. So again, um, we kind of wanted a novel approach and uh, most projects obviously not developed in a vacuum. There are previous projects, prior art, there's some context that you bring to every project you make. And we bring a lot of that baggage to our API design as well. So uh, we tend to not just implement things in a new way, but in one way that we're used to. So with Urkel, we consciously make the decision to prove that each API design actually works well and is actually what we want. So we're trying to actually make good choices and decisions and eliminate assumptions. And that's particularly important for us because, as I've mentioned, we're in a space where Relay and Apollo, specifically Apollo, dominate. So we have to treat them as prior art rather than blueprints that we're just imitating and copying. So although oftentimes it may seem like we're ending up on the same decision or similar APIs. A lot of these decisions have come from exploration of whether it could be different and alternative approaches could be taken. So there are some differences, there are some similarities, but uh, ultimately we're questioning everything that we do. So that out of the way, um, if we kind of look at first principles in general, I've kind of mentioned that developing from first principles, all I'm saying is we're kind of trying to start from scratch here. When we built this GraphQL client, uh, we started from a very simple fetcher. You may have heard of GraphQL request. It's very similar to that. All we, we did before was just send a request to GraphQL API, get a result, render it out. Um, so what is the role of GraphQL and GraphQL clients if we kind of start from scratch? And if we maybe start with a Google search and you type in why use GraphQL, you may come up with a bunch of common answers. So I hear the same things I, in how GraphQL is sold again and again, and people explain it in similar ways. So oftentimes we hear maybe we'd find someone saying GraphQL is good at optimizing API data delivery. Because we don't over underfetch, we specify what we want, you know, it can be high performance due to that, we don't have waterfalls. Um, the development speed can be improved with GraphQL, and that's not wrong. So another thing we may hear is also um, that we kind of find a more tailored experience towards improving communication across teams. So it's common to build back and forth front ends with GraphQL. It's kind of a good way to document an API. It's kind of a good way to get some you know communication out of the way with the tooling in terms of maybe the back-end team and front-end team, if your teams are separated that way. And that's also not wrong, right? But ultimately, if we get to kind of the deeper point there, if we kind of get to the true strength of GraphQL, I would say we have to deeply look at the standard itself and its intention. And like everything, GraphQL wasn't developed in a vacuum. GraphQL is a set of standards that if we adopt them, we can agree on and standards that we can build on. Um, importantly, that means that we have a set of minimum operating principles. So that's kind of the part of standards we can agree on. GraphQL has features that an API team may choose naturally. You might want some schema documentation like GraphQL has built in. You might want to have stronger types. GraphQL has that as well. So a lot of the conversations that you may have in your team, if you wouldn't be using GraphQL, those all fall away. Docs, no docs, should we use Swagger? All of that is kind of answered pretty quickly. If you would, were to choose GraphQL, you're kind of starting on a higher common ground. That higher common ground already has made a couple of decisions, but ultimately 
its feature set and what GraphQL encompasses is something that a lot of people can agree on when it comes to APIs. So it's a combination of ideas that were around before GraphQL, but all in one bundle that all comes with GraphQL. So again, some of these things are actually pretty interesting and novel, but uh, have been done before in different tooling. So type guarantees and kind of documentation like that is new. A lot of teams add Swagger for the REST APIs. Data shaping isn't new. A lot of different RESTful frameworks allow you to include or exclude data and uh, model relational data specifically. And GraphQL is error aware, error handling. A lot of teams will come up with their own error conventions. Maybe even when you use GraphQL, you might add some on top. It's all not, uh, it's all not very novel, but at the same time, these are all things we can agree on. And that brings us to the second part of why this can be useful. GraphQL kind of encompasses standards that we can build on. So when we use GraphQL, that kind of tooling commonality becomes a platform. Everyone can rely on GraphQL being that, that schema language becomes kind of part of uh, how you can build on GraphQL, how you can build clients on GraphQL. And these are kind of the things that make GraphQL really interesting to interact with. So the client server language, the uh, GraphQL query language is pretty interesting in that we're kind of stepping out of the world of making simple HTTP requests, but at the same time, allows a much more succinct way of communicating from clients to servers. So GraphQL clients specifically will always interact with that language. But at the same time, on the backend side of things, there is still that reusable ecosystem. Um, the reusable ecosystem of uh, the schema, for instance, using which we can automatically generate documentation, like uh, with GraphQL, we can reuse a lot of the tooling. What's more interesting for GraphQL clients is this last part. GraphQL clients can do a lot because they can make assumptions. They can make assumptions during runtime and automate things. And if we kind of um, take that idea and we apply it onto the app tree and kind of onto how we build componentized apps, GraphQL abstracts relational data queries. And if we kind of compare a tree structure of components to a tree structure of data requirements, we find that GraphQL's relational kind of data flow is very similar to how we already model data and state in componentized apps. If we split up our app into this tree of components, then GraphQL basically just allows us to define data requirements in each of these levels of these components. So it kind of imitates a flow that we may already have in this context. So the GraphQL client's responsibility is then what's left over. Uh, it interconnects that data by a set of data requirements. In our app, we have a bunch of queries that define what data we want. The GraphQL client's responsibility is just to query that and deliver it. So we can now kind of break down uh, our goals. We want to bridge the UI code and GraphQL. We want to be able to basically easily define our queries and let the GraphQL client take care of uh, requesting them. We want to deliver updates reactively, and that's pretty important because GraphQL has a lot of interdependencies between data as well. When we, for instance, send a mutation, we're sending an instruction to change some data on the backend. And that also means for the client that some other queries that depend on that same data must change. So any GraphQL client that interacts with data should have some mechanism to update queries to kind of take in new results as they come in from the API. And lastly, uh, we kind of expect our GraphQL client to have some kind of abstraction of caching, no matter how simple or complex, and it should abstract a lot of the control flow because ultimately once we're in the UI world, we don't want to think about making a request, retrying requests and things like that. We want to kind of hand over that responsibility to the client. Now, how that looks in Urkel is kind of like this. Uh, we have a UI part and we have a client part. Uh, in the UI, you might use something like in our React bindings where I have use query. You will pass in a query and it will send them over to the client. We call that the operations flow. And that's kind of the inputs. As our components kind of change, they may generate new queries. So that means our query will subscribe to a new, um, to a new operation. 
And then once the client receives that, the, client, that the UI will um, issue this query, it will start sending requests and it will eventually deliver results back. Uh, so as the UI subscribes to a certain operation, it will eventually get GraphQL results. And specifically, if we kind of break that up into certain time slices, um, this is kind of more of the React terminology here and kind of React looking, but it does apply to any kind of UI library and the principles will always be very similar. We have kind of a, a first stage where on some kind of mount when the component initializes, it sends the query and it will eventually receive a first API result. So that will typically be once the API actually responds with that result. But um, the UI may also change its queries. You may actually update the component and it may want a different query result. Uh, and then it will receive that result as well in the future, but it may also receive more results, maybe because another part of the app has requested that same query. So it's not limited to a single update, to a single result. And then lastly, uh, when an operation has no subscribers anymore, when a component is done uh, with one particular query, then it will be torn down. So at that point, the client will know that a query is not in use anymore. So we have this really nice flow of starting a subscription to some kind of query operation, getting some results, and then stopping it. And this kind of abstraction of reactive streams works for all kinds of UI libraries. This abstraction applies not only to React, but similar terminology and similar principles apply to other libraries. And that's kind of why uh, when we architected Urkel this way, this meant that we're also getting support for other UI libraries automatically. So um, to kind of list a few, we kind of started with React support initially. And later on, Preact followed naturally because Preact is obviously kind of an offspring library of React. But we also now support Svelte and Vue. So on the website, we have a lot of fronts covered. And while Svelte and Vue are a bit newer, if you're working with Svelte or Vue and you have some opinions and you'd like to take a look, leave some feedback on the repo and we'll get to it. Uh, we're still improving some of these parts. And that kind of brings us to the second principle. So now that we've um, seen that now that we've kind of seen how, how the uh, subscriptions work to queries, we kind of have decided that a client must also be highly versatile and extensible. So we've seen the initial API, but this now comes down to uh, GraphQL. The GraphQL standard has a GraphQL.js reference implementation, but ultimately it's just a standard and everything that happens kind of in between it can change. So people are doing a lot of different things on top of GraphQL. We have different implementations of GraphQL subscriptions. For instance, via WebSockets, we have some uh, standard editions where we have some non-spec editions like file uploads or persisted queries. And kind of to support that, we can dive into how the client itself works. And we've kind of seen how an individual hook may send queries and receive results. And on a kind of macro level, if we look at the client itself, the client treats all of those queries from all parts of UI uh, as one stream, one like kind of big input of multiple operations. So the client receives all of these operations from your different parts of your app and it will deliver results corresponding to each one. So it's kind of like a huge train station with lots of arrivals, lots of departures, and it manages all of that together. So it doesn't differentiate between different queries once they enter the client. And then once they exit the client and go to your UI, it kind of splits them back out. This is kind of done using a unique identifier that is generated, but that is all treated internally in the client. Um, I'm not gonna get away without showing some code. So specifically instantiating a client is pretty simple. We have kind of our URL, that's the basic start. And these exchanges are optional. So here we started to customize something. We're passing in three exchanges, which we're calling the default behavior. So that's deduplication, caching, and fetching. Fetching obviously being the one that goes to make the request to the GraphQL API, and this is the last one in the list. And that brings us to our plugin system exchanges and actually to the extensibility part of Urkel. 
We can only make Oracle's flexible as its plugin system. We have these exchanges that are like middleware that you may have in Express or Redux. They provide some added logic. Um, so they're like plugins, but this slide is really long. Basically, Urkel's client just delegates all of the real work to exchanges. So all we need to know about exchanges today is that they're plugins, and Urkel does everything using these exchanges, everything using a plugin. So you can customize them, and everything's abstracted into those. Uh, but in this talk, I'm not going to get into how they actually work internally, because it's really similar just to Redux or Express middleware. And to kind of drive that point, um, Urkel's client only makes up about 40% of the core package's size. The rest are all core logic and exchanges. So Urkel's client makes even less of the core package's code in terms of lines of code, but most of it goes into having all of these separate exchanges. And it's not really important which ones there are. We have some for retry logic, some for authentication, we are seeing the fetch exchange again. We have some for persisted queries and file uploads and so on. But what's important is that exchanges really do do everything in Urkel. So we have a cache exchange and a second exchange called graph cache. So that brings me to the point that even normalized caching is just an exchange and optional. Caching itself is part of this middleware flow. Caching itself can be swapped out and caching itself is just an extension that you can customize. And we have two different ways of handling uh, caching. So we have a so-called document cache, and that's our default behavior. And this default behavior is like the browser behavior. Uh, it caches like a browser. It has a certain you know, key associated to the operation, like a URL to a JSON document, and we're caching by that. And whenever a mutation just sends another request and it contains the same type name as a query did, that query is um, invalidated. So it's refetched. Compare that to normalized caching, which is probably more like what you would do uh, if you were setting up a manual Redux store. So normalized caching automatically derives different entities from our GraphQL data. So every object is stored separately in something like a database structure in tables. And any changes that one query makes may also be propagated to other queries. So everything kind of shares data, and this is the other side of the extreme of caching. Well, the document cache is really volatile and will invalidate data aggressively. The normalized cache is really conservative and will keep data around for as long as possible. But Having seen that the plugin system in Urkla, so the exchanges are extremely flexible, and we can easily add a lot of exchanges. We can, for instance, say we want to add retry logic, persisted queries, all of these features. Um, we're adding a lot of exchanges, and that must not trade in ease of use. So one principle that we introduced very early on was no matter what's added, that thing that is added, that feature, must not kind of increase, like kind of, on, on what you already have, it cannot like compromise ease of use, must still ever, like remain very intuitive. And that also applies to the exchanges themselves. A lot of them are in separate packages, and these packages are often built to be more opinionated than Urkel's core package, than Urkel's client and its bindings. So while you're adding more exchanges, you kind of gain to a higher degree of like kind of an opinionated degree, so to speak. And the other part is that that means we had to make a decision on how to kind of structure Urkel. And as I mentioned, we made the decision to have separate packages. And a lot of concepts in Urkel in general are kind of uh, designed fractally. So that means when you're looking at Urkel, you can get started really quickly. We have some basic guides that you can start in a couple of minutes. But once you kind of get through it, you may reach more concepts that you want to understand that you can dive in into separately. So learning Urkel is kind of a step-by-step -step process instead of you having to look at the entire API or kind of see one API while you're actually searching for another. And that's reflected in our docs as well. Uh, our docs is very much structured by topic rather than you know being a one large guide to step through. The basics guide would give you a getting started guide and after that it's pretty much a free flow 
guiding you through different sections so you can get deeper and deeper into the topics you're actually interested in. And while these are all of our guiding principles, uh, of which there are three, um, we kind of have not really seen any of the particular decisions yet we've made. We've kind of seen a bit of the API design that we've initially made and kind of how we achieve these principles in general. Uh, but I wanted to kind of give some examples of decisions we've made in the past that are, I think, pretty interesting and different from how you would usually approach this if you were to start a graphical client right now. Uh, one of them is each of the bindings we have that gives you a fetching flag. And this fetching flag basically intuitively tells you, uh, is an API request being sent? And as we've seen previously, Urkel kind of um, has this client, we send it queries, it gives us results. There is not really a fetching Boolean flag that we have. And instead, that means we've kind of replaced it. Every kind of UI piece that connects to the client decides it's on its own, whether it's fetching or not. And it's doing so by matter of finding out whether it's waiting for a result. So there are two different states in which you can be in. Let's say you mount a component. It can either be waiting for a result or not waiting for a result. But it knows whether it's still waiting by seeing whether the cache has responded synchronously, so immediately with a result or not. If your UI binding is not receiving any result from the client yet, it knows to set fetching to true. You know that you need to wait and then once it receives a result, that's when it knows that fetching can be false, and it kind of merges that result and it makes it accessible to the UI. So that means that we don't really have a flag that actually indicates whether a network request is being sent. Instead, it's very much delay-based, something synchronous or not. But there is a second flag that is pretty useful to actually find out whether you can expect a new result. We have this flag called stale, and the idea of this flag is you never really need to know whether something is fetching or not because you primarily are interested in whether you have to show a loading screen or not. But at the same time, if you don't show a loading screen and you show a result, you also maybe want to know whether that result is stale or not, meaning whether you can expect a new network result that will update the current screen. Because if you don't know about this, you may introduce some flickering where you're quickly switching to new values and that doesn't look very nice. Uh, so that's kind of a flag to indicate that something's loading. So in practice, that means you may get a result immediately from the client if you tell it that you kind of just want to use a cached value. But you can also tell it that you want a network result afterwards. So then the client will start fetching a new result, and all you will see is still your old result, but set with the stale flag to true. And then once the new result comes back from the API, that's when the stale flag will be false again and you will have a new set of data. So kind of these little mechanisms to make sure that your UI renders up-to-date data or older data if it would like to. Now, one of the interesting ones is I've kind of mentioned our normalized cache really briefly. Um, but what's really interesting about it is that we've added a lot of smaller features to it that might not be visible on the surface if you're coming from Apollo. And one of these features is called schema awareness, and it gives us the ability to render partial results. Relay has something similar as well. Uh, we're still improving the API kind of to align on something similar. But the whole idea is you can pass schema information to the normalized cache. Once the normalized cache has schema information, it can make a decision of whether to render a page early. So for instance, if you've already been on a listing page and you go to a details page, maybe these two display the same item so they can kind of share some data. But the details page is very likely to require more data than the listing page. So what can happen in that case is we kind of send a query for the list. We have some common fields that we're requiring. And our schema says that these both render an item. But once we go to the details page, we fetch some more fields that the cache doesn't know about yet. So one thing that we've added with schema awareness is if you're kind of enabling this feature, it can give you null for the details, or at least it can set the next nullable field to null while it's waiting for more data. So you kind of render part of the details page already while you're waiting for the network result to come back from your API. Now, 
all of this is pretty tricky to make safe, but graph cache layers and orders changes or results as it receives it from the API automatically and safely. So it does a lot of different work under the hood to kind of enable these features, but two of the internals that are interesting are optimistic updates and commutative layering. So specifically, optimistic updates would be changes you make when a mutation is sent that are reflected in the, in the UI immediately while the network request is still sending. And part of making that safe is kind of a layering approach. We want to be able to layer changes in our normalized cache so that once a real result comes back for your mutation, these temporary changes in your cache can be removed. And all of that complexity sounds pretty intimidating when you read about it in like a more hidden page in the talks. But all of that is actually quite interesting because it enables us to add offline support even. We think GraphQL is a really good candidate for bringing offline support to the web because of its type guarantees and because of its kind of runtime automation features that a GraphQL cloud can implement. And Graph Cache supports offline support, but uh, that kind of goes beyond the scope of explanation in this talk. I have a blog post on this. The URL is on kitten.sh if you want to find out more about how our normalized cache works and how it kind of achieves this. Now, I've kind of shown a bunch of different features and a bunch of different oddities. Um, I kind of what I then want to get to is that the last point is uh, the kind of idea we set ourselves or the goal we set ourselves is we want to do more with less bytes, keep performance high. And that's a pretty easy goal to set, a harder goal to keep. But as it stands, Urkel is still extremely compact for the feature set it has. The core package is extremely small. And the normalized cache as it is adds a minimal amount of bundle size. We have a comparison page that goes into detail of that. But compared to Apollo and Relay, it can achieve much smaller sizes. And even more so, in an actual app, if you have really simple requirements, uh, like GraphQL request of just sending requests, there are even some tricks to swap out the GraphQL standard library to make sure the app is even smaller. But as it stands out of the box, Urkel always aims to keep your app fast and add as little bytes as possible. And that kind of leaves me only at the outro, uh, where I would probably reveal you know, our secret roadmap and future, future features. But our roadmap is not so secret. And you can find it on the projects board on GitHub. And this is kind of part of our public RFC process. Uh, you can always go in. Anyone can go in and submit RFCs if you have an, an idea of what you'd like to see change in the API. You can start a discussion. Eventually, it will go into ready and planning. And then either a core team member or someone else can pick this task up. So everything that's ongoing in Oracle right now is very public. And to kind of summarize specifically what's coming, we're kind of currently working on having more examples in repo because our examples are a bit outdated. We'd like to see more demos. We are working with the team at the Guild to bring better GraphQL code generator support to Oracle. So that will kind of include a relay-like framework approach as well. And that brings you to the last one, Urkel framework. We kind of like to move towards a place where we can have more recommendations for users like Relay does, but kind of still keep our flexibility. So you could opt into its framework features and kind of get an easier method or recipe to apply to your apps to more quickly assemble it and kind of use GraphQL. But that's kind of it for today. That's all I have. Thank you. There we go. All right, Phil, that was awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction to Urkel. This is a very exciting library that uh, I've been having my eye on is one one that I want to get more familiar with. So appreciate the uh, the overview. That was uh, that was great. I think uh, if you're up for it, we can move into a little bit of Q and A. There are a couple things that came through in the the live chat. If you're up for that, all right. I hope it's not all about the problems with screen sharing. <laughs> no, I think it worked out all right. We got a little bit of chop on your slides, but that's just fine. I think it came through with uh, without too too much of an issue. So Ben asks, uh, he says, we're using Remix doing GraphQL fetching on the server side. Does our call support running on the server? It does, yeah. We have a package called Next Urkel. Uh, Next just is so ubiquitous, so frequently used that we made a package to make that easier. 
That's actually the first example we're launching because there's a lot of different ways to use Next for static rendering, server-side rendering, just client-side only. There is the old get initial props API, the new APIs. Um, there are a lot of combinations and ways in which you can use Next. Um, and Remix is a lot more reduced. So it's actually uh, contacting the Remix team about that to kind of start talking to them about it. Uh, as far as I know, they're maybe not quite there yet to think about things like uh, integration with Urkel, but we've already offered them to specifically build examples for and with Remix. Awesome, that's cool. Uh, kind of a specific question with, ne I guess, the next case. Um, what happens when you, so like you'll you'll do your GraphQL call in the server portion of your, your component, um, but then how do you actually, let's say you, you do a query to hydrate your page when it loads or something like that, and then you want to deal with mutations later and updating state uh, and keeping it in sync from that initial call that happened on the server. Is there like a bunch of trickery that happens to make that uh, to make that go? I, I'm thinking of cases where like with Apollo, for example, like if you, um, I mean, I guess you could do it with Apollo, but if you maybe use something like GraphQL request to, to make that initial request on the server side, get some data, and then you want to interact with something like Apollo, you've got things that are sort of not talking to each other. Um, is there anything special that happens uh, with Urkel to make to make that work? There's not much special happening uh, per se. So if you're just interested in server-side rendering, all that's happening is we're making some uh, fetch request on the server side instead of mm -hmm. on the client side. So what we've actually decided to do is make a generic SSR exchange. And that SSR exchange collects all of these results on the server. And on the client side, it can sometimes, like the rest of the caching pipeline, go, hey, I, I've already fetched this on the server. You can just use okay. this result instead. Um, as far as I'm aware, Apollo doesn't do this. And they instead rehydrate the entire normalized cache. And that has some disadvantages in terms of what can happen in terms of that data tearing. Uh, whereas the worst case that can happen with the SSR exchange is it will just fetch on the client side if it doesn't find a match. Gotcha. That is a bit separate from persistence, though. Once you use our normalized cache, uh, there is also persistence for offline support, where it persists to, uh, for instance, index DB or local storage. Right. And that's actually more tricky than servers at rendering because there you don't have the results synchronously. So right. it actually pauses all of these uh, operations, rehydrates all of that data because that's asynchronous, and then it looks and goes, hey, do I have this in my cache now? Right. Um, and that's a bit easier because our bindings, again, don't care about any kind of fetching state. They decide themselves whether they're currently waiting or not. So mm -hmm. this kind of just works. But there is some more trickery going on once you would use offline support rather than just server-side rendering. Got it. OK. Very cool. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we'll move to the next one here. Is there an easy way to migrate from Apollo to Urkel? Any kind of uh, tooling around that, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, so we don't have tooling to migrate directly. But that's mostly because if you're using React or Preact with the Apollo hooks, uh, then it's really easy already to migrate. The hooks are very similar. We haven't written a code mod for it even because all you have to switch over is just put the query in some options. Our APIs are very similar, but um, it will really depend because our normalized caching approach is very different. And actually, when we came up with it, we were working on a couple of apps and we had all of these update functions in different parts of our UI. So often you have one part of the Apollo app updating another query here and there. And uh, once your app grows to a certain size, the funny thing that happens is you, you're trying to centralize it again. Because like four parts of your app are now updating, I don't know, the user because of the header bar. Or all of these, you know, update your uh, shopping cart if you're building an e-commerce app. So you're building all of these utilities and bringing them back together. And we actually decided for our normalized cache that all of that should start out in a central configuration hmm. because it all is a concern that is separate from your UI. Your UI code should never contain instructions on how to update the rest of your cache because in that particular piece of code, you're just interested in making that change to send that mutation. Um, so no, that, that normalized caching code won't port one-to-one. -one. But the APIs and the principles of how the caches work are similar because they're both normalized caches. There is probably less to do in terms of optimistic updates because of our layering approach. Um, you're probably able to write some more simple code and will just work. Um, 
but yeah, a code mod was an idea, but it mm -hmm. wasn't requested very often yet. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, um, I think that's it for questions. So thank you so much for answering those two, Phil. And thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we do have uh, at least one quiz question that we're going to get to of yours. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe you'll want to stick around. The, um, the thing we're going to do first, though, is take a look at some uh, stuff that I've got, which is a little bit of a, a pitch for Prisma. So Prisma is putting on this GraphQL uh, Berlin meetup. And so we should talk about Prisma a little bit. Prisma, what is it if you're not familiar? It's an open source ORM for Node.js. So if you are working with the databases, you probably are if you're building an application, um, you're probably going to need some way to access that database. And if you are interested in doing this through an ORM, Prisma is, we think, the best game in town. And we think it is the best game for these three reasons. You get the Prisma client. This is a way for you to access your uh, your database through uh, through TypeScript or JavaScript if you're, you're in a Node.js environment. We've also got a client for Go um, and uh, potentially more clients coming in the future. This is a great way to access your database because you get type safety with it, which we'll uh, we'll talk a, a bit more about. Another of our products is Prisma Migrate, which is um, a very easy way to keep your databases um, changing and evolving over time. So you might make a change to your data model. You can get very easy migrations all managed through Prisma and have those changes applied throughout your database. We've also got Prisma Studio, which is, uh, I guess you can think of it as the, the modern way to do uh, PHP my admin. So it's a full UI showing your uh, your database. You can manage your data through it. You can make changes to your data. And it's a great way to, to, uh, to view your data. Uh, what are the benefits of Prisma, you might ask? Uh, higher productivity being one, and increased confidence being number two. Higher productivity, I think, because you can move very quickly. Um, describing your databases through your schema is very easy. It's it's a really simple um, uh, language, the Prisma schema language, as we call it, and you will get uh, you'll get your full database model whipped up in no time. You can also introspect existing databases, so you can derive a model from an existing database, and increase confidence because when you go to access your data, you do it through TypeScript, and you have types a type safety layer on your your database access, meaning that that writing an incorrect query or a query that is um, not valid is very difficult to do. So you can have increased confidence that the code that you're writing to make your queries uh, is what you actually want it to be. Um, and it's designed for building APIs. So lots of us here at this GraphQL meetup are interested in APIs of sorts. And uh, with Prisma, you can put it into whatever you want, GraphQL included. Um, the way that you would get a hold of it in a Node.js context is something like this, where you might want to find many posts. When you generate your model, Prisma is going to give you uh, access to, in this case, a post model, like a, a number of blog posts. And you can run queries like find many. You you can put it in all of your options. And this will generate a query that you can make against your database, um, which will give you the results you expect. And like I mentioned, it is very easy to use this in GraphQL. Essentially, in your resolvers, in your GraphQL API, you will stick in a call to Prisma. Um, that call will go to your database, pull out your data, and send it back to your client. And you can check out more uh, on how that all wires together if you go to prisma.io slash GraphQL. We've got a page dedicated to uh, how Prisma works together with GraphQL in, uh, in this way. If you are interested, too, in getting um, a bit more familiar with Prisma, uh, you can check out this course. This is a course we've got. Um, the author of this course is someone who's been familiar with Prisma for a long time, Dr. Steven Jensen. Uh, it's a uh, it's a course end-to-end -end React with Prisma 2. So it's React and it's uh, it's Prisma in the mix. You can get a discount. It's 100% discount code active for the next three days. And uh, we're going to put that code in the chat. So the code is end-to-end, -end, April 13th, APR 13. That is going to give you 100% discount to this course. Uh, great feedback about this course if you're interested in learning Prisma. 
Prisma, it is something that will be of uh, a big benefit to you. So that's about enough about Prisma. If you are interested in more information, please feel free to reach out to us. You can uh, you can hit us up on Twitter, twitter.com slash Prisma. You can um, go to our website, prisma.io, where you can find more information, or just uh, reach out to me on Twitter as well if you like. Maybe, Natalia, if you could put uh, those links into the chat, that would be just great. And Phil, thank you so much for sticking through that. We've got your quiz question up next. We're going to get ready for the quiz here. Um, we're going to get ready to go in just a second. We'll let people kind of settle back into their Slido uh, context here in, in their mobile devices or, or wherever they might be. And I think we will go ahead right now. The question is this, what are Urkel's plugins called? Links, exchanges, or plugins? So we've got three options here for the, uh, the plugins that are relevant to Urkel. Are they called links, exchanges, or plugins? If you were paying attention to Phil's talk, this should be fairly straightforward. We'll give it a sec here. We got up to about 20 respondents in the last set of quiz questions. Perhaps we'll have fewer now, perhaps not, but we'll just give it another couple seconds as it settles down. And then we should be good to go. All right. Oh, you just have a note. It's getting up there. Getting up there. May have had some people drop off. I've been watching the the uh, the attendee numbers uh, as we've been going here. We have been sticking around sixty between sixty and sixty five, I think, uh, all the way through. So that is great. I'm going to give us five more seconds on the quiz. It'll be over in five, four, three, two, one. Boom, exchanges as the top answer, 94%. Someone snuck in there as a 16th respondent. Um, we have got most people saying exchanges. That is, in fact, correct. So great job, everyone there. And now we're going to switch to some Prisma-related stuff um, from my little spiel that I gave just a second ago. And I'm realizing now something that I missed is I didn't tell you which databases Prisma supports. So... What are we going to do with this? Well, I think we'll let people respond. We've already got 10 people responding anyway. So um, if you are familiar with Prisma, you'll probably get this. If not, good luck. I apologize for not mentioning the, the databases that are supported. Um, I can say this, though. We support relational databases. Um, we support uh, the, the popular ones, the ones that you might expect. We've always got more plans for more support coming in the future. And in fact, we have plans for no SQL support as well. Uh, MongoDB being the most requested NoSQL uh, database flavor. And support for that is actually close, closer than you might think. It is it is underway. Support in terms of uh, it as a preview feature anyway, not something that'll be production ready per se uh, immediately, but something that you'll be able to play with very soon. So that is very cool. And I think we're up to our uh, 16 that we had last time. So I'm going to give us five, four, three, two, one. Which database does Prisma not support? Amazon Redshift. Is that the correct answer? It, in fact, is. So yeah, we've got SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres. We've got SQLite, uh, plans for MongoDB, plans for many others in the future as well. So Ben is at the top, number one, six out of six, a minute 29 there. Um, let's see, Prisma tool that is most recent to have reached general availability. Is it Prisma Migrate, Prisma Client, Prisma Studio, or Prisma Cloud? I am realizing again that I did a poor job of giving you the setup for this question. I told you about the products we have. I told you about Prisma Migrate, about Prisma Client, and Prisma Studio. I didn't talk about Prisma Cloud, so there's a clue. Um, these three products have been working their way their way towards general availability over the course of time, and we just made one of these generally available very recently. So if you've been hanging around Prisma for a while, you may know just what this is. I will give us another five seconds here. Five, four, three, two, one. Most people say Prisma Migrate. That is correct. Prisma Migrate is now generally available. And uh, this kind of, uh, this rounds out the, the the whole stack of ORM tools that you might want to use if you're doing serious applications um, and you need something to help you along the way. 
All right, Ben is at the top, six out of seven, minute 29. That is it for the Prisma questions. Phil, thank you for sticking with me through that. I uh, appreciate you being here, and thank you so much once again for your presentation. I guess we'll, we'll catch you next time. Yeah, cheers. Thanks for having me. All right, bye, Phil. Okay, we are on our way to the very last talk of the day. And the very last talk of the day has got two great speakers uh, giving the talk. Adi Pradap Singh and Mariano Car uh, Carbayel uh, will tell us about scaling GraphQL at Zalando. So in their talk, they will share their journey scaling GraphQL as a unified backend for frontend or a UBFF solution to 200 plus developers and 150 plus contributors in Zalando over the last two years. And they'll also share tools, concepts they have, and concepts they have used to solve high scale related challenges to their GraphQL service. So with that, I am going to welcome them in. So Mariano and Abby, welcome to the stream. Um, thank you so much for being here. We want to get your slides up into the mix. And so I'm wondering what we should do there. Who's gonna share screen for this one? Uh, I think I will do it. All right, Addy, that's great. So let's uh, share your screen and we'll pop that right in. All right, so I believe we've got it here. Um, and Natalia, if you want to juggle things around there so that we've got the two of them. Just give us one sec here while we get sorted. <coughs> All right, I think we're good to go. So without further ado, I'm going to give the stage to uh, Addy and Mariano. Welcome. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. Today here we are, uh, we are here to present uh, Scaling GraphQL at Zalando. So we had some uh, really cool talk before us with Tiny GraphQL and with Urkel. So now we'll share uh, more into, into the scaling problem of uh, GraphQL, especially if you are a larger organization or a mid to largely growing organization. Uh, brief introduction for uh, us. So hi, I'm Aditya. I'm the engineering manager for the edge routing and GraphQL platforms team at Zalando. And um, I'm Mariano, software engineer at uh, Zalando as well, um, part of the platform engineering team. Good. So before we move on to the actual uh, topic, we would like to give a brief about Zalando. So for those of you who are joining uh, uh, from outside uh, Europe, I think, uh, or even uh, Europe, uh, we are the uh, leading fashion e-commerce company in uh, Europe uh, with uh, 10.7 billion uh, GMV last year, 38 million customers, and more than 3,500 brands on our platform. Uh, so Zalando's uh, principle so, uh, so far has been like convergence of fashion, tech, and convenience. So this is something which has enabled over the years to serve our customers with latest fashion and uh, uh, their, their uh, needs. So before we move on to uh, the problem we are, uh, and the, the journey we had with scaling GraphQL, let's uh, do a quick brief about the, the background, right? So where we come from. So before GraphQL, uh, in 2015, Zalando uh, adopted uh, something called uh, radical agility, which uh, was a move from monolith to microservices. And we created uh, these microservices to allow teams to move autonomously. And uh, web actually came uh, up with something called front-end microservices, or micro frontends, uh, if you will. And we created a framework called Mosaic, uh, as you can see in this uh, image here. The part which we are interested in today is these fragments, which are uh, Node.js microservices, which were responsible for HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, as well as the data aggregation part in most of the cases. For mobile apps, we used to have backend for frontends, wherein uh, you have backend for e each of the mobile app views. So there will be one for the product detail page, one for the wish list, catalog, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> But over the period of uh, time, what we realized is this uh, microservices move actually allowed us to move much faster. But also, we started observing some problems which we didn't uh, before. So first one uh, was uh, discoverability, which is a front-end developer working on a feature had to figure out where should they get their data from. 
Uh, second is inconsistent experience, which is uh, the Zalando customer would see different uh, uh, data or experiences on different platforms. So this is an example from uh, for delivery dates, where the same customer saw two different uh, delivery date range in the mobile web, uh, mobile app and the web experiences. Slow pace of delivery. So since we had uh, different backend for front ends as well as uh, different micro front ends implemented by autonomous teams, it also meant that at times uh, the same feature was duplicated across teams, leading to slow pace of delivery. One of the the key triggers, uh, which was not as a, like a problem but more like a requirement, which was missing in the previous architecture, was personalization, and kind of the trigger, right? So uh, before personalization was an afterthought and not part of the architecture. So what you see here in this image is Zalando's homepage currently. And uh, this uh, content is currently personalized for each and every uh, logged in Zalando customer. But in the previous architecture, this was very tricky to do. So with these problems, now I will hand over to Mariano to discuss what we did to address those. OK, you're going to hear some next slide, next slide, multiple times to control Aditya's uh, uh, finger. So um, uh, Mosaic was built uh, with the problem of autonomy and fast growing in mind. Personalization was never a concern in the, in the Mosaic architecture. However, at that moment, in Salando, the personalization was a hot topic. So the question was how we build or how we enable personalization in the in the platform. So we analyzed how to provide it in the old architecture, but it was, as Adita mentioned, was really, really tricky. So we, at some point, we realized that the, the same architecture that enabled us to grow fast now was creating like invisible walls and it was hard to evolve. So why, what if we create a, a new framework that considers personalization as a first class citizen. So we decided to shift our paradigm, right? So in abstract personalization is about entities and their relations. Uh, if I get recommended, for example, with certain products, uh, it means that I'm close to those, those products. So that is how uh, the entities becomes, uh, became a central point of the architecture. From technical point of view, the new architecture can be decomposed into three main layers. One is the rendering layer, the other one is the entity model layer, and the other one is the entity resolution layer. The, the view layer is basically uh, in charge of creating the output that the client is going to see, the customers are going to see. And also it's in charge of specifying what are the data requirements uh, that are going to be uh, required for rendering a view. The entity model layer is the one we are going to talk about today. This is the, basically the GraphQL API that we, we created. And then you have the entity resolution layer, which is a personalization layer that we talked about before. So for example, let's, let's give an example for this. A customer goes into a product page. The entity, in this case, is the product itself. There is a view associated with this entity. For example, this, this one is going to be the product detail page but there is also data required to render this view. But the, the, this product could also have other related entities, uh, for example, a carousel, um, I don't know, collections, outfits. Um, so this entity resolution layer uh, is in charge of selecting what are the entities that are relevant for a given customer. Then the, the rendering layer will, in a recursively manner, try to resolve and render all these nested views and there, until there is nothing else to, to render. So at this point, we need to choose a technology that we wanted to use to model this new architecture. When we analyze GraphQL, we uh, observed that it's, it's sort of very well our principles that we, we wanted to match with the, the product vision that we have. And personalization was, as I mentioned, was about entities and their relationships. And this is you know, a graph, basically. So, and GraphQL is a language to query a graph. So GraphQL was a really, really uh, good fit for, for this uh, framework. 
Also, GraphQL is becoming popular at that moment. So that was another uh, reason to choose it. So we knew that um, this reusable ecosystem that Phil mentioned before. Um, and finally, the, the team members were, was constituted, um, the, the team was constituted mainly of ex front end developers. So that was good to understand what are, what were going to be the requirements of our customers, let's say, or stakeholders. So in short, our vision was to create a unified um, API that different customer facing applications, let's say mobile applications, web emails could query to, in order to get data. And that should be simple. That should be easier for them to, to, to do it. With, with this, in, uh, this basically addresses the problem that Aditya mentioned before, right? Like uh, inconsistencies, uh, this problem of personalization and so on. So at this point, we decided to create the POC. The POC was um, this collection page that, can, that you can see in the, in the right side of the screen. Uh, it was a good choice because it doesn't receive so much traffic. So uh, actually it was um, a good start. So we perform an A-B test. Uh, between the old and the new framework, and the, the results were a little bit disappointing. Like say, the keep all the KPIs were worst in the new architecture, and when we dug into and we tried to figure out what was happening, we observed that the performance was the main reason. So let's start to, to see what were the the, the um, stack choices that we made. So the first setup was basically Express and Apollo. So uh, the as I mentioned, the performance was was in good. So the first the first intent was okay. Let's shave shave the, uh, these layers off. Mm -hmm. So we remove Express and we remove Apollo, and we end up with Node HTTP server, a vanilla JavaScript, uh, vanilla Node HTTP server plus GraphQL JS. Mm -hmm. And we observe a small improvement, but nothing that will allow us to go to production. So we at this moment we we were about to hit the wall. Uh, it was impossible to uh, roll out that in production with this kind of uh, performance. So we did some performance tests to understand why we got such bad performance results, and we found found that most of the CPU time was spent on the uh, GraphQL execution engine, specifically on the parsing and the validation part. Our main client, that was this rendering layer, was issuing big batches of small queries. And this, of course, caused a lot of overhead. It was simply too much for the servers that were around at that moment. So one of our colleagues, um, uh, his name is Rui, had a really clever idea. Why, what if instead of paying the cost of this execution, at runtime, we move that cost ahead of time. That is how GraphQL um, um, was created. Uh, basically, the GraphQL JIT is an execution engine, a GraphQL execution engine that compile these GraphQL queries, persist them, and generate JavaScript call, code. That JavaScript code is then executed later in time whenever you give an ID to this server, that is going to basically execute some JavaScript code, just to make it make it, uh, it more clear. GraphQL JIT means no GraphQL. So there is no GraphQL in GraphQL JIT. You just have an ID and you execute JavaScript code. The, everything created with GraphQL happens before. We did some benchmarks and the results were shocking. So uh, the throughput of the server was enough to unblock the, the pressure, of course. Uh, and we will able to continue and deliver the first POC to production. So there is a very nice talk. Uh, this uh, engine was presented in the GraphQL Conf 2019, in the, uh, the GraphQL Conf in Berlin 2019. So if you want to check it, uh, we are going to share the links uh, later uh, at the end of this talk. Now, once we finished with this, we started adding more and more use cases. At some point, we started to observe that the event looked like 
for those that are not familiar, data and load lag is a, measure, a measurement of performance in uh, Node.js uh, applications. It started to increase. So again, we did some performance tests and we find that most of the CPU time was spent on JSON parsing. So how do you optimize JSON parsing? Uh, not JS that does a really good job there. So how do you optimize that? Well, the answer is simple, less of it. So GraphQL of the problem of underfetching and overfetching between clients and the GraphQL server. Um, but what about the, the communication between the GraphQL server and the backend services? In this case, we have a bunch of microservices that we are connecting to. Uh, ton of them. I, I don't remember. Is 20, Ari? I don't know. 100 it's now? Than, it's more than 60 right now. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of them. Uh, one of the most common options to optimize that uh, is patch. So basically, you have a get by ID operation in the server, and you instead of doing one call per ID, you are fetching, you do everything at once. So it's, instead of doing performing 10 uh, requests, you do only one. So uh, still, you can get more data that you need. Suppose uh, if you only need the name of a product. In a common REST implementation, I will perform this get by ID operation, and I get the full product representation. But why? why what do I need if I if if I need only a part of the representation and not all of it? Uh, how do you do that? It would be great if those uh, REST servers were GraphQL servers, but they are sadly they are not. So thankfully, for most of our backends implement something um, that is called partial responses. We can, if you if you change the slides, uh, next one please. So you can see how uh, partial responses are um, implemented in the in the bottom of the slide. So basically, you pass an ID, you pass the fields that you want to see in the responses. So by inspecting these persistent queries, what we did is we analyzed the persistent query. We see which fields we have a dependency inside that says, okay, for this field I need this other field. We aggregate all those fields. And we aggregate the queries as well, and we watch everything together to perform the less amount of requests that is possible. So at the end, this reduces substantially the amount of JSON parsing that we were doing at, at that moment. But this is not everything about performance. Uh, we went through a lot of organizational issues uh, due to the increasing domain complexity. And that is something that Aditi is going to talk about now. Cool. Thanks, Mariano. Yeah, so uh, like Mariano mentioned, I think uh, one of the th key things we observed while scaling the GraphQL platform uh, we built is uh, not everything is about performance when it comes to scaling. And uh, uh, we know that we will have more use cases for, for performance optimization in future. But for now, I think our uh, current setup allows us to scale uh, more and more use cases. But we all, uh, also want to share our experience with the topics which are not uh, performance only, but more on the, uh, let's say, the contribution and the delivery of topics, especially when you have a centralized uh, GraphQL platform. So since we had this unified GraphQL where uh, you know uh, all the features are build, uh, being built in the same uh, application, uh, in the initial days, feature delivery was about driving. So what we mean by driving model is uh, feature delivery was being done by the platform team. So uh, uh, we were building features for other teams to consume the, the GraphQL schema. But this wasn't scalable. Right, we were uh, a group of let's say six engineers, and we are going to be bottleneck if we have more and more use cases. So what we moved to is a collaboration model where we were working closer with uh, feature delivery teams and delivering features, and this actually helped us to scale a bit further. But uh, this was not going to scale uh, to the to the let's say ambition that we used uh, that we had. 
So what we eventually moved to is a contribution model uh, where feature teams were contributing to the GraphQL monorepo that we built. And as platform team, we were providing them all the tools, developer uh, productivity tools, and also, uh, let's say, uh, trainings. And uh, uh, for their adoption, there uh, we were also providing uh, documentation and guidance uh, for the same. So with this model, uh, current uh, this is the current model we have at Zalando. It works uh, out really well. And uh, the numbers for the contribution looks like this. So we have more uh, than 150 contributors to this monorepo from 30 different teams uh, and even more, I think. And uh, this is very frequently changing, uh, these numbers. And we have more and more use cases. And we have 200 plus developers from both web and uh, app, mobile app at Zalando, who are using uh, this GraphQL platform. So uh, yeah, with the contribution uh, model, everything uh, was also not something you know uh, was working perfectly. So we did observe some uh, issues that uh, was becoming bottleneck for us as a team, and uh, we would like to share the high, uh, the two main ones. Uh, first one is the business logic in the GraphQL layer, and uh, second is the schema design. So. What do we mean by business logic, right? So if you remember from uh, the initial slide about uh, mobile apps or micro frontends, they used to do data aggregation, business logic, and some platform specific uh, responsibilities. But uh, since uh, GraphQL layer that we built is only about aggregation, where does the business logic go? And if they, you have too many, uh, like a lot of domains, as Mariano mentioned, with outfit or product, uh, this, this is kind of specific to that domain. So this was a, a challenge for us uh, when the contributions were uh, made to uh, the centralized system. And in order to address this, uh, we actually built a very comprehensive integration guideline, uh, which provides uh, do's and don'ts, basically, for uh, what uh, can go into the uh, GraphQL layer and what needs to be handled by the domain teams. Go ahead and schema design. So I think uh, this analogy of uh, the elephant and uh, plant uh, people, this uh, is very uh, representative of the coherent schema design problem where people had only uh, understanding of their own domain and not the whole unified uh, schema, right? But for a front-end developer, they would want to understand, uh, look at the GraphQL uh, from a, a single point of view and not domain specific. So what we did is we, uh, created uh, API design for the schema, GraphQL schema. And we use schema linters to uh, enforce those uh, API design as part of the build pipeline. And this has helped us a lot uh, in terms of scaling and not having to, you know, providing these feedbacks uh, very manually. Uh, in terms of developer experience, so uh, we use persisted queries, as Mariano briefly uh, pointed this. And what we did is we created uh, this persisted query browser which allows uh, the developers using uh, GraphQL to actually do a lot of uh, commonly used uh, features that they need on their own. So uh, we, are not, uh, we have not shared everything that we have uh, done and we are doing uh, in terms of developer experience, but let's say you know, the main ones which have helped us a lot, including this browser. And if you can see in this uh, uh, view, we already provide at persisted query level monitoring and open tracing and ability to directly run this inside the GraphQL ID and many other functionality at each and every ID level, uh, each and every persistent query level. And in future, we also can uh, use this and extend further developer experience tooling around it. In terms of observability, as I mentioned in the previous one, this is a screenshot from one of the uh, open tracing uh, views, dashboards that we have. And uh, this is auto-generated. So if you are someone using GraphQL, uh, this comes out of the box for you. Uh, same goes with uh, monitoring. So these matrices are generated uh, at every query level. And if you, you just use, you don't have to do anything in order to uh, create this kind of uh, monitoring. In terms of figures, so uh, currently uh, we are serving more than 80% of Zalando's web use cases. So for those of you who are aware, uh, as Zalando has a huge traffic, and this 80% uh, use cases are already um, being served from this GraphQL platform, and uh, more than 50% of mobile uh, app use cases and even further growing because we are committed to uh, moving all the web and app use cases to common, this common uh, GraphQL platform. 
uh, at peak time, which is uh, the cyber week for Zalando, we have measured more than uh, a million queries per second, so distinct queries. But since we use batching uh, across those queries, uh, this means more than 40,000 HTTP uh, requests per second. And these are some of the screenshots for the views that it's a Lando a mobile app or web that is being served. Uh, and there are many others. So what's next? Uh, so, so far, I think uh, we were kind of in the adoption phase of GraphQL and learning. And also with these 150 contributors, we have uh, learning to uh, use GraphQL and contribute to GraphQL. So the maturity was uh, in the, let's say, learning or growing phase. But we are now at a time, uh, at a uh, stage where we uh, see that a lot of teams and a lot of contributors are already mature enough. And we are thinking about uh, federation. So if you're a, uh, a large organization or a quickly growing organization who wants to use federation, I think uh, our experience uh, says that first, I think uh, using it in a way where there is a team responsible for the schema would be better before jumping onto federation. But uh, this is the point where we want to also explore federation and uh, we'll see what happens next. So uh, some of these topics we only uh, touched uh, in a very uh, brief manner, uh, but we have a lot to share in each of these concepts and tools, and we'll uh, share further. Uh, one way we are doing it right now, and uh, we have this blog series uh, for Zalando GraphQL uh, blog post, where we share these topics in details. So the look ahead uh, which we uh, shared here is also added as a blog post. And if you want, we will share these links uh, with everyone. So you, you can find it uh, in detail and more topics to come in in the future. Yeah, and uh, we are hiring. So we are hiring for software and senior software engineer positions. And if any of these topics uh, excite you or is interesting for you, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, even if you have questions and uh, you're not just look, uh, you know looking for uh, applying, uh, we are more than happy to answer any of the questions you have. And that's it. Thank you. You're mute. Sorry about that. Thank you both so much for your talk. That was really great. Uh, appreciate you you doing the talk and, and staying a bit past time to do that. Uh, we have a few questions if you're OK with uh, answering those. Let me pull them up here. Here's one from David. Did you consider running GraphQL as a Lambda function? I'm not sure if the context for that would be apparent or not, but. Any thoughts about GraphQL as Lambda functions? Did you uh, do you want to answer, Ari? Yeah. Or should I? Uh, I can take. Oh, it. go. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Lambda functions, we have discussed about uh, GraphQL as Lambda, and uh, I think uh, the architecture at Zalando, since we use Kubernetes for uh, deploying applications, it already allows us to go as granular as we would want. But since we we don't see us going granular when it comes to the GraphQL platform, uh, at least in the near future and we have a unified schema, uh, going with uh, Lambda didn't fit, uh, seem like the right fit for us. Got it. All right, cool. We've got another one here for uh, from Hendrik. Is GraphQL JIT turned off in development, or do queries have to be compiled first? Does this slow down development? Go ahead, Daddy. You yeah. can take it. So, uh, it's turned off uh, in development, yes. Uh, the, the JIT part comes into picture when uh, the users of the query want to persist. So uh, we have this environment called GraphQL Preview. Uh, actually, uh, one of the things to share about uh, JIT and persisted queries is we don't allow uh, actual queries to run in production. So we uh, have to, like, this is uh, something which we deliberately chose. And only persisted queries are allowed in production. So in development uh, mode, uh, and in preview, actually, developers can uh, run the actual query. They don't need to compile with uh, GraphQL JIT. But this is only needed in production to avoid these performance uh, uh, bottlenecks that we used to have. OK, excellent. Um, we've got one more that just popped in here, maybe slightly tangential, but uh, nice articles. Do you use some app for illustrations? Yeah, it's really uh, <laughs> uh, It's getting pretty popular. OK. Excellent. Oh, there's another one here. Which ORM are you using? Prisma also is your whole backend stack in Node.js. ORM we aren't using, uh, actually. 
we do have a Postgres uh, server, uh, but that's just for uh, saving this persisted query IDs that uh, Mariano was explaining. Uh, since we are a stateless application, we uh, only integrate with backend services. So Zalando had a lot of backend services and domain backends, uh, let's call them. So we integrate with them. So we uh, did not need uh, an actual ORM use case for us so far. Perfect. OK. Excellent. Well, that's about it for questions. So thank you both so much again. We do have uh, we we've got some survey questions though, um, some quiz questions that we'll we'll start uh, to go towards now. So let's uh, let's do this. I'm going to pop my screen in, and I'm going to take that off. And so let's move right along with the survey. It's the get ready stage. Uh, we have. A good proportion of the folks that were initially in the quiz, um, participating in the quiz earlier on, still here. So that's great. We will wait a, just a minute here for us to get situated, and then we'll be on our way with the first question. Why don't we get going right about now? All right. What are the problems that Zalando faced with a micro front end architecture? Was it discoverability, inconsistent experience, slow pace, personalization? Or was it performance and personalization or performance and slow pace? So three options there for the problems that Zalando faced with a micro front end architecture. I'll wait for the answers to roll in maybe until we get up to around 15 or so, and then we should be good. There was, while we wait for that, there was one more question that uh, that came into the chat that maybe we can, uh, maybe we can pop in. I'm just waiting to see if this is gonna, okay. It doesn't look like there's any more respondents. Let's just pop this question in really quick. Uh, since you're not thinking about federate your graph, did you guys already check uh, how are you going to handle with new challenges like type sharing across multiple subgraphs and so on? Yeah, this is something which is uh, kind of very nascent phase. So we haven't even th thought about these problems. But uh, once we do, probably we can share it uh, in, in terms of uh, our experience or whatever uh, we come up with us. OK, excellent. Thank you. Cool. So it looks like we've got 11 respondents. Let's move on here. 73% uh, said the first option, which included discoverability and incons an inconsistent experience. And that is, in fact, the right answer. So great job there. Ben is at number one. Let's move on to the next question. What problems did we try to solve with GraphQL JIT? Slow query execution, want to customize the GraphQL query execution, or create support for persisted queries? Which one was it? Slow query execution, customizing the execution, or support for persistent queries? We'll wait till we get maybe 10 or 11 people responding here, and then we'll be on the way. This is the second to last question. <clears throat> Afterwards, we will show the winners, the top three to win prizes. Once again, the prizes today, Bedrock License and Prisma Swag. So it looks like we've got 12. I'll give us another five, four, three, two, one. We are moving on. Slow query execution was most popular, and that is the right answer. So great job there. We're on to the last one now. Ben still on top. Um, here it is. How do we optimize JSON parsing? We do less of it using lookaheads. We use protobuf or we use thrift. Three options there for how to optimize JSON parsing. Once again, we'll wait until we get about 12 or 13 people here with responses. And this is the very last uh, quiz question, after which we will pick the winners. All right, we've got 12. So if you are wanting to submit an answer, you have five, four, three, two, one. We are done. So the most popular answer using lookaheads, and that's the right answer. So great job there. Ben comes out on top. He's got nine out of 10. Uh, Kevin is number two, and Shabam is uh, number three. Those are the winners. Those, those are the top three. Those are our winners today. Uh, the hardest question 
from the whole set was this one, which Swift feature was used to emulate the list of fields in Tiny GraphQL. If you remember all the way back to our first talk, um, this question uh, presented the most challenge to, to folks. So um, uh, there it is. Otherwise, we have had, I think, a great time doing this quiz. We've got three winners. Natalia is going to, um, to put into the live chat how you are to claim your prizes. So uh, look into that live chat to figure out how to get your stuff. Enjoy it. Uh, show us what you look like in your Prisma swag too. If you get Prisma swag, uh, maybe tag us on Twitter and we can uh, we can retweet you or something like that. Um, all that aside, I think we're basically at the end. Let's see here. Do I have anything else? Um, we want to uh, hear from you about the meetup, how it went, what's good, what's not. Uh, you can reach out to us on Typeform. We've got a link to uh, to a Typeform set of questions for how you how we can make this this meetup better uh, any suggestions that you've got would be greatly appreciated so Addy mariano thank you so much for your talk for joining us today i'd like to thank all of our speakers everyone who was here thank you so much and of course all of the attendees thank you so much for being here thank you for sticking with us through it um this has been graphql berlin number 22 and um you know i guess we'll see everyone at number 23 until then take care Thank you. Bye-bye.